Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's our pleasure tonight to welcome another veteran of that conflict, Mitchell Cady. He relates his personal experience as an infantryman assigned to the 87th Golden Acorn Division during World War II. You know, a lot of young Americans who turned 18 in 1943 didn't live to see their 19th birthdays. Like many of them, Mitch Cady, the Brooklyn-born son of immigrants from Beirut, found, him in the, found himself in the infantry headed for the bloodiest Western European battles of World War II. Mr. Cady holds the, uh, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, the Bronze Star Medal, and, and uh, with that, with uh, three battle stars. After the war, he received a journalism education and has worked for three daily newspapers, a television station, and public radio in upstate New York. In 1963, he contributed articles to a Pulitzer Prize-winning series, and in 1993, he won a Project Censored Award for freelance investigative journalism. He's also worked as a speechwriter and legislative aide in New York State Legislature, and he is currently the 87th Division Historian. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mitch Cady. This is amazing to me. Uh, I, uh, I was sure that uh, not only that nobody cared about uh, World War II, but that uh, you wouldn't find this place. And so this is a tribute to the people that served with me and deserve to have this kind of a turnout in tribute to the fact that they sacrificed their lives and well-being in one of the few wars that, in retrospect, I felt absolutely had to be fought. And anybody who fought it, either fought it or reads about it today, uh, can't fail to agree that it was not a war of choice. It was a war that uh, was imposed on us, and I want to just mention one or maybe two dates. Everybody knows that the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. How many people know what happened on December 11, 1941? Anybody? What happened? Uh, Germany and Italy declared war on December 11th in the morning. Congress was sitting that day, and in the afternoon, Congress passed a resolution of war against Germany and Japan and uh, Italy. And I was one of those who was privileged to serve with one of the outstanding organizations that was called upon to fight that war. I'm going to read to you just one or two paragraphs written by George Patton to uh, the 87th Division Commanding General on 13 September 1945. And you know that uh, the war had ended a couple of months before with the dropping uh, of the, well, in the case of uh, the European war, it ended in May. But here's a letter, my dear General Kewen, please accept for yourself and pass on to the officers and men of your splendid division my sincere congratulations on the magnificent fighting record you established. From the day you entered the line in the blood spattered mud of the Saar Valley, this was in Germany, through the bitter struggle of Bastogne, and then across Germany, the 87th Division always lived up to the highest tradition of American valor patriotism, and efficiency. It was a proud privilege to have such a unit in the Third Army. Truly yours, G.S. Patton, Jr., General. That's just emblematic of what I believe 
the 87th uh, Division accomplished, obviously not by itself as part of the 8th Corps, as part of the 3rd Army. In retrospect, I've uh, read a lot about the generalship, Patton, and General Middleton, who was the 8th Corps commander. General Middleton, some of you will remember, made the decision to hold Bastogne. And, uh, of course, General McAuliffe became famous when he said nuts to the unrealistic German demand for surrender at Bastogne. Uh, the, the two generals, uh, Middleton, who was a, a three-star general, and uh, McAuliffe, who was a one-star general. So Middleton uh, knew he's, that uh, McAuliffe was taking orders. McAuliffe wanted a bug out of Bastogne. And Middleton, who had been <coughs> one of the most heroic soldiers in World War I, he knew tactics. And he told McAuliffe, you stay put because General Patton has promised to activate the Air Force and they will drop you supplies. You'll get shells through the air as soon as the weather opens up. You'll get food. What you won't get, they needed doctors and nurses because Bastogne was surrounded and they had a high casualty rate. But the key fact that has rarely come out is that the decision to hold Bastogne was made by General Middleton, the Corps commander of the 8th Corps. And the 87th Division was a part of the 8th Corps. Um, if you read carefully, you'll find that uh, the 101st Airborne was almost, but not quite, surrounded by the Germans. Uh, for practical purposes, uh, they were still under siege, no question about it. When the 87th Division and the 11th Armored Division arrived, it was late in December. The weather, was, as some of you veterans of the 87th who were sitting here and some of you other veterans will remember, was extremely bitter. We must have gone through the whole uh, two weeks of uh, December and maybe all of uh, January with the thermometer never dipping, never getting above, uh, oh, maybe 10 or 15 above. Most of the time it was below zero. And in a foxhole, uh, it's a little cooler because you're three, four feet down. Um, one of the things that I don't think uh, has gotten out to the public about fighting the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes Forest is uh, that a forest is a series of trees, and trees live by collecting water. And uh, if you dig a foxhole in the forest itself, not outside, uh, chances are if you go down more than a couple of feet, your own feet are going to get wet and stay wet. And although uh, German weapons took a horrendous toll, uh, my reading since World War II suggests that um, uh, we lost, we, we started out with about 9,000 infantrymen in a division of about 15,000. The others were artillery, quartermaster, engineers, and uh, support services. We even had a, a, a small cup plane, spotting planes, which uh, proved revolutionary in uh, its uh, uh, ability to detect where the Germans were. And um, so nearly all the casualties that were sustained were sustained among infantrymen. Anybody who was in the infantry uh, can uh, confirm that. Uh, the riflemen, uh, light and heavy machine gunners, mortar gunners, the people that were up front uh, on the line, 
day in and day out, because that's where the shrapnel fell, whether it was artillery or mortar shrapnel. Um, it was constantly raining down on the front lines and killing young infantrymen. We would, uh, we had actually two divisions uh, from the uh, constant uh, German assault and the weather assault. I, I imagine the weather must have been uh, more effective uh, than the Germans were, uh, just as effective in uh, knocking people out because the temperature, the snow was three, four feet high in some places. The temperature very rarely went above freezing. It was always around zero in the 10 degree uh, range. And um, that's, that's one war that both sides were affected by and both sides uh, suffered in. There's no question about it that we suffered as much from the weather as we did from our enemy's uh, weapons. Uh, I want to say that uh, the 87th Division was comprised of, and you'll be maybe surprised by this, Northerners, primarily. New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, and mostly was a Northern Division that had, because of uh, the way the war broke, we had uh, ex-Air Corps cadets. And the reason that they came in the infantry was that the Army made a uh, decision that they would be, quote, supernumerary, which means useless. And uh, so they put them in the infantry. <laughs> but we got a lot of smart guys. And we had uh, former cadets from the Army Specialized Training Program of whom I was one, I, I, uh, after taking some kind of competitive exam, I went to the University of Mississippi, I went to Clemson College, Clemson, South Carolina, and then after D-Day, when they realized that uh, they couldn't afford to have their uh, infantrymen in college after D-Day, uh, they put us in the infantry. And so the 87th Division had what you could call a high IQ, high AGCT, Army General Classification Test. Uh, reading this book, Scholars and Foxholes, convinced me that uh, the, uh, the smart infantryman, a guy who can think, uh, is, a, is the most effective soldier. Surprising. He, this guy came to this conclusion and having served with them, I can't dispute it, I believe it, that if you have the two faculties, if you're smart and you can, and you can think under fire, you're the most effective soldier. And so we had a Medal of Honor winner who had been in, um, the Air Force, and he was from upstate New York, and we had a Distinguished Service Cross winner who was from Pennsylvania, and in those days, this was before they decided to grant the Bronze Star uh, to anybody who won the Combat Infantry Badge. That's how I won the Bronze Star. Um, the Bronze Star and the Silver Star were uh, not widely bestowed, and they really meant something, especially the infantrymen who uh, fought for them. So uh, that gives you uh, some idea of the composition of the 87th Infantry Division. It was northern, predominantly. It was predominantly what you would have to say um, accomplished uh, in uh, scholastics, and it was well led. Um, we had uh, several generals and colonels 
Although you didn't see those guys on the front lines, by the way. I've been asked this a million times. Uh, did I ever see Patton on the front line? I did not. However, I talked to other people, and yes, Patton did come up to the front line. He was a three-star general, but you couldn't get a one-star general. You couldn't even get a colonel to really go up where the fighting was. We, we lost one lieutenant colonel uh, that I remember uh, who was wounded. Other than that, uh, the privates, the PFCs, the corporals, the sergeants, the staff sergeants, uh, the tech sergeants, and the second lieutenants, the second lieutenants fought the war. In the 87th Division, as Patton wrote here, um, we participated in the bitter, he calls it the bitter struggle of Bastogne. Bastogne has uh, come to be known, and maybe rightly, uh, as a high point for the 101st Airborne. But Bastogne was not the Battle of the Bulge. Bastogne was the most uh, visible symbol of the Battle of the Bulge. And even today, if you talk about the Battle of the Bulge to people, they say, well, you had Bastogne. I don't blame them, but I'm here to assert that since the Battle of the Bulge, uh, George Patton came up with what I think is a workable definition of what a battle is. A battle is a, uh, an engagement uh, that ends after you push the enemy back to where he started from. I accept that. And that was the Battle of the Bulge. And all the divisions that engaged in the effort to drive the Germans back to where they started from in Germany. They all were part of the Battle of the Bulge, and the Battle of the Bulge, in my reading and writing, uh, was the longest battle of World War II. Uh, it started on December 16th, which is a very famous day, and it didn't end until uh, early February. If you look at the 87th Division history book, you'll find that we had not driven the enemy back to where he started from, because he started from Germany. We had not driven him back until about the first week in February. So that's how long the Battle of the Bulge lasted, the longest and largest battle in, in American history. Patton's um, um, watchword was uh, attack and keep attacking. And when you have done that, attack some more. So uh, we were one of the attacking divisions. And we not only drove the Germans back to where they started from, but then we drove into their homeland. And we crossed first the Moselle River under fire, which you'll remember very well. Were you there then? The Moselle River. And then, uh, after we captured uh, Koblenz, wasn't it Koblenz? I think it was Koblenz, big city. Uh, we crossed the Rhine River under fire. And uh, that's when I turned 20 years old on the day we crossed the Rhine River, March 23rd, uh, 1945. And uh, it, it was uh, a war of uh, successive victories, but certainly paid with a high human price. Every American has every right to be proud, to be patriotic, to remember that that was a justified war. We did not declare war against Germany. Germany declared, and Italy declared war on the United States four days after Pearl Harbor. 
It was no Iraq. It was no Vietnam. It was none of those wars. It was a supremely justified war of defense. And uh, over the years, I have done so much writing and so much historical investigation that I have never found that I, I understand there's a book now that claims that uh, World War II was not justified. Um, I can't remember the author's name and I haven't read the book, but I would say that anytime anybody wants to take that position, all they have to do is to talk to somebody who lived in occupied Holland or Belgium or France or any of those countries that were occupied by the Germans, do you think they'd say a thing like that? I've talked to them. I was uh, in Bastogne walking around downtown Bastogne for the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, the uh, Battle of the Balls. A woman came up to me, hugged me, and she said, if it was not for you Americans, we'd all be Germans, she said. She's a Belgian lady, and she put it in a very few words, uh, very effectively. Excuse me. So I don't see, since the Germans were not only occupying these countries, but um, they were certainly uh, cruel and human, uh, and they were trying, of course, uh, to put their fascistic policies across throughout the world. So when you think of justified wars, those of you who lived through World War II know full well that that, that was a war that was justified by events and was, and is today, in retrospect, there are very few people who uh, today try to rewrite history and say that it was not a justified war. Uh, I, don't, I never did like the idea of shooting anybody, and I still don't today. And I certainly do not approve of some of the recent wars, but if there was ever a war that had to be fought, and that was fought brilliantly and valiantly, it, it was World War II, and if there ever was a unit, um, uh, we actually, if we only had 9,000 riflemen and machine gunners, I was a heavy machine gunner, um, and mortarmen, just 9,000 out of a division of uh, 15,000, the rest were uh, service troops, um, it was, it was a price uh, that, in retrospect, that history has already judged had to be fought and was well worth it. And uh, future wars should be judged by the basis on which World War II was launched. Uh, and I certainly don't approve of many of uh, the wars in all kinds, all parts of the world where there was no real justification. That was not the case in World War II, and I thank you all for listening to me. I thank you all for coming. You know, wonderful people. I know uh, what I said was not new to you, but I wanted to underscore it with some facts and statistics. And I hope uh, many of you are on uh, the internet. Um, I have a lot of articles uh, on the 87th Division website. And uh, uh, you're more than welcome uh, to enter the website and uh, read uh, some, some really fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, tr it's very difficult to find out this. One thing I was just telling, the, I think I told the Colonel about this, uh, that there was a war after the war, so to speak. 
uh, the, there were German troops in Czechoslovakia who didn't want to give up. So some of the 87th Division men went into Czechoslovakia and they said, the war is over. And the Germans said, no, the, we, we wouldn't surrender. So they kept fighting. So we lost some men <laughs> trying to convince these guys that the war was over. And uh, when we were coming back, we received a letter from our commanding general, General Kulin, and he said, the 87th Division spent 154 days in combat. Well, if you count from the time we were committed until the E day, you don't get 154. But we had uh, casualties. We had deaths in Czechoslovakia. So he figured the war is still going on. <laughs> and he, he counted casualties after the E day. I, I, don't know, I wouldn't argue with him. He's probably right. Let me end, uh, because I think I've spoken uh, long enough, and uh, thank you again for coming. And yes, I'll be glad to respond to anything you have on your minds. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for Mr. Katie, again, we ask you to come to the microphone in the center. If you're physically unable to get to the microphone, just raise your hand and I'll bring you one. Sam, you want to start? Just go over the total casualties for World War II or the Battle of Bulge only. Um, that's a very good question because I've researched that. And I've concluded that, uh, not by myself, but we have a 87th Division statistician who supplied me with a lot of reliable figures. Uh, the official count is 81,000. I don't believe that. Um, I think uh, it probably was closer to 100,000. Uh, they had to jigger the figures in order to make it look like uh, the Americans really won the battle. Uh, we really did win the battle, but we paid a high price. Uh, my guess is that they were on the light side by at least at least uh, 10,000. And another thing they never mentioned uh, were uh, POWs. Uh, our, our company, I was in uh, D Company, 345th Infantry, our radios weren't working. In those days, uh, radios were very problematic. And uh, we were trying to get a, a squad, I think it was machine gun squad, uh, out of a, a house. I have a picture of the house because we went back after World War II. If somebody wants to check with me, I'll show them a picture of the house. Anyway, uh, I'll find it. Um, they didn't receive uh, our notice to, to uh, withdraw, so a, a Tiger tank showed up. He uh, put his 88 millimeter gun in one of the windows, and uh, they were able to communicate enough that they knew that this guy was going to blow up the house. So we did lose 12 men from D Company, 345th Infantry. Not all of them survived. Um, some died in the POW camp. Uh, some tried to escape and were cut down by German machine guns. Uh, but um, there was a guy by the name of Ralph Carver who lives in Erie, Pennsylvania. I talked to him about three weeks ago. And he, uh, he has written, and you'll find stuff on the 87th Division website about his uh, trials and tribulations uh, in the POW camp. He, he once showed up at one of our reunions with some other uh, former POWs, and they said, you see these pictures? And they were concentration camp pictures, emaciated guys. They, he says, that's how we looked. If the war hadn't ended when it did, three or four more weeks of starvation like this, and we wouldn't be here. But uh, the war ended, and uh, they came back. And uh, uh, most of them were so highly impacted by their incarceration that uh, they didn't live very long. But a, a few of them uh, survived, and they're still around. If somebody wants to talk to one, uh, get in touch with me, and uh, I'll put you in touch with Ralph Carver of Erie, Pennsylvania. Anything else I can respond to? Yes, sir. After the war was over, how soon did they start picking the small arms ammunition back from the American troops? How did they start pulling it into the armories? Did you? Everybody was running around with all this ammo. How soon after that war was over? 
Yeah. After the war's yeah. over? Yeah, they start taking the ammunition back from the uh, infantry men. So. Oh, sure. I mean, how soon did that happen? Oh, um, you, uh, how soon uh, you have to distinguish between when they ordered it and when did it actually happen? Well, they ordered it almost immediately on VE Day. By the way, uh, there were two VE Days on the front lines. Uh, May 7th, they said, was the official date. And they said, oh, no, 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 it's May 8th. So, um, as far as ammunition is concerned, we kept the ammunition because the Germans were uh, surrendering in large numbers. And we were, you know, sequestering them behind wire and all that stuff. We couldn't keep up. They were surrendering in such huge numbers. So we all, uh, not only uh, did we have loaded weapons, but the safety catch was off. No safety catch. We were ready for the OK Corral if it happened. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think I was on a machine gun in a jeep. Hey, wait, wait, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Can't hear you. I just want to share you. Get, I'd like to have your phone number to get in touch with you later. 585 585 424 4746. MKD at Rochester.rr.com. Thank Went the long way around. I was wondering about your personal experience. You mentioned that you were a heavy machine gunner. Just how you were used, what it was like being in the field, uh, you know, what it was like for the... Yeah, I had to get around to that, shouldn't I? Because uh, uh, my topic was supposed to be reflections in a foxhole. Well, I don't want to reflect about a foxhole. <laughs> Who can blame me, right? It was cold down there. It was colder than out, uh, being outside. Uh, and sometimes it was wet. And uh, sometimes you had another guy in the foxhole with you. Uh, that was a mixed blessing. Uh, you warmed up against his body, but you were stiff as a board. How can you move? Uh, unless you built a two-man foxhole. You didn't dig that much. That would just wear you out trying to dig a real two-man foxhole. So you dug a one-man foxhole and put two men in it. Right, right. Sam? So, uh, a two-man foxhole, uh, there were some of them, but not many. And I believe that uh, being out of a foxhole was worse than being in a foxhole because uh, you're liable, to, uh, the winds were blowing, you're liable to get pneumonia. You, uh, in a foxhole, it depended, I suppose, on how wet it was or whether you got frozen feet. Um, you know what they told us to do to prevent frozen feet? You uh, you were supposed to take your shoes off and you had them on for weeks and weeks and weeks. I didn't get a shower. Six months. Uh, and that, that's confirmed uh, by a guy who was in my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> he was in a foxhole with me. I've showered since then. Um, uh, I was saying that uh, the, the uh, uh, being in a foxhole with another guy, yeah, you warm up against his body, uh, but um, you had to keep your feet warm. You didn't. But they told you to do something. They told us to take our socks off. Uh, we had two sets of underwear, wool underwear, on usually and a couple of shirts, and a uh, field jacket. And um, they ordered us to take our socks off and put them against our body. And you know how much that smelled? I, I don't want to describe it. But that was their method for drying socks on the front lines. Uh, anybody here, you, you were in the 87 Division, did, did you hear anybody say that? Yeah. Well, uh, in my company, in uh, my battalion, my regiment, 
That's what they ordered us to do, take our socks off and put them on, under our underwear, and they would dry out, sure, if you could stand it. Yes, sir. Anybody else? You probably did the same thing, uh, the sea ration can, we fill them with sand and then saturate them with gasoline and build a fire and that would cut us more, keep our hands warm. Well, um, in, in my experience, because uh, we were right outside of Bastogne and um, all hell was breaking loose, there was a siege going on, there wasn't too many, there weren't too many fires. Um, uh, movies, uh, Hollywood movies notwithstanding, there were no fires on the front lines at night ever that I saw. And you all can immediately understand why. Because it immediately drew artillery fire. And so we had no fires at night, maybe a few fires uh, during the day if you had a way to shield them. But otherwise, you just, uh, your teeth shattered and you just froze on the front lines. And your weapons were impacted, a lot of weapons. The M1 rifle was probably the best American weapon on uh, the front lines in World War II. Uh, the the uh, Germans had a wonderful machine pistol and that was the most effective weapon on the front lines on both the American uh, and uh, Nazi sides. Yeah. I'm going to, oh, I'm still. <laughs> I don't want to take any credit from the wonderful speech that this man gave. But I thought he was talking about me for a long time. <laughs> I was in the Air Force, and because I had been in the infantry before, uh, they put 65,000 of us back into the infantry. So we went overseas, I went overseas as a private because uh, they already had the regular army cadre. I came from the mountains. I live now in Dublin Gap. And uh, I seem to be, since all of the Air Force people were college boys, I seem to be the only one that could get them at night on patrol back to our lines. So they made me a sergeant. I went in and said, I'm not going to be a sergeant. And uh, the captain said, you'll do the job whether you're a sergeant or not. So <laughs> then I became a sergeant. <laughs> I don't, so he told so many things and I agree with all, everything the man said. Uh, in my case, I got hit with machine gun. I was in Patton's third, I was in the third division in Patton's third army. Okay. Uh, we got, we rushed in there shortly after the 16th. I lasted until the 26th of January. At that time, there were only seven of our original company left. Everybody else had been killed or wounded. I got hit with a, a machine gun through the shoulder at three o'clock in the afternoon, and of course, there was no place to go. At five o'clock, I got hit with a tree burst that split my leg open from my buttocks to my ankle. I was in the hospital for a year, almost a year and a half. Uh, I, I never told this story to anyone until my son came to me one day and he said, Dad, you haven't mentioned any of this stuff to us. In all of the time you've been home, tell us some things. Well, I couldn't tell them. I broke down. So he got me a recorder. So I sit at home at night by myself, and uh, I will record some of the things that happened. And you would not believe, you would not believe, you would not believe what happened. You, if, you've not, if you weren't there, you could never believe what happened.
give him the next speaker. Very eloquent. Um, yes, sir. States or overseas? Overseas. Um, I'd say, and I want the, my fellow uh, combatants here to back me up or dispute it, uh, I'd say any wrong body was welcome. On the other hand, uh, there was skepticism about these replacements. Um, for, say, the first few weeks or a month or so, they had to prove themselves before they'd be accepted. And uh, we had uh, some tragic, at least one tragic accident with a replacement who was given a 45 caliber pistol, and uh, he cleaned it and uh, pulled back the slide and uh, put the uh, bullets in the handle and then pulled the trigger and killed our most heroic tech sergeant, who was uh, from New York uh, State. And we all got together and said, there's no reason, that there's no purpose served by our reporting how this guy got killed. Uh, I got an email from the guy's uh, brother about two years ago. I told him the same story that we had concocted on the front lines. Um, I don't know whether you would agree uh, with what we decided, but I've stuck to it uh, over the decades, and uh, I think we made the right decision. Um, it was a terribly, unbelievably tragic accident, but there's no point in saying anything but that he died in combat. Right? You agree? You agree? Yeah. Okay. I hope I don't. Yes, my, my question has to do with uh, firing your weapon. What sort of instructions did you have? How did you decide when to engage a target? Could, 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 could you fire any time you wanted to? Did you have to conserve ammunition? That sort of thing. I don't remember when uh, the ammunition shortage uh, really impinged on us very much, no. You couldn't. Uh, if, if you were the front man and you were being uh, targeted, you made the decision when and where and how much to fire back. Always, always, under all circumstances, as far as I remember. Bob Brown's father was in my company, and they're from Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm glad to see him. What did uh, you talk about uh, Curtis Shoot? Get, get close. Curtis Shoot. I wanted you to talk about Curtis Shoot, what happened uh, with the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. Yeah. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, I know something about Curtis Shoup because uh, uh, his father uh, was a minister in Buffalo at the time he enlisted. He was not from Buffalo, although his Medal of Honor citation says correctly uh, that he entered military service 
from Buffalo. That's correct, technically. But he was from a small town outside of Oswego, and I put up a plaque to him at, uh, all about seven or eight years ago. Uh, what Curtis Shoup did when the 346th Infantry Regiment was attacking the key city of Tillet, T-I-L-L-E-T. -L -L -E it wasn't a city, it was more like, it was a village, I guess. Uh, he uh, uh, grabbed a uh, submachine gun, and he thought that uh, if he stole from one side carefully, uh, that he could flank uh, two, not one, two German machine gun nests that were firing at his company and keeping the company from entering the village of Tillet. And uh, he was successful, sneaked up, and fired his uh, uh, submachine gun and, uh, and disposed of the first machine gun nest but there was another machine gun nest, and in the meantime, he had been wounded. He was lying on the ground. He was still firing, and the Germans fired at him and killed him. So it just happened that uh, our commanding general happened to be in the area. So Curtis Shoup won the Medal of Honor. Uh, Tillet was undoubtedly the 87th Division's uh, toughest battle and most crucial battle. Uh, we had this uh, Pennsylvania guy, uh, Glenn Doman, uh, won the uh, Distinguished Service Cross. They weren't handing those things out left and right in those days. So you, 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 to win the Medal of Honor, you have to die, maybe more than once. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, they also handed out <coughs> silver stars and <clears throat> bronze stars at the time. Some things happened there that uh, sound like a movie. Um, <clears throat> um, a German <clears throat> came out to an American who was outside one of the houses and uh, put a Luger pistol behind his back and uh, said, you walk into the American lines there and they're not going to shoot at you. So uh, they were walking, and an American uh, from this guy's company was able to sneak behind the German who had the gun leveled in the guy's back and shot him dead. So uh, there was uh, more to it because uh, the Germans in a house went up on the roof and put a hole in the roof and started firing at the Americans from my division, 346th Regiment. And so the uh, Americans fired back and finally uh, they were able, because of the constant fire and uh, circling around this house, they were able to get the Germans down and it's just my guess that they probably plugged him in the head by the time they got him down because there was no holes barred in the town of Tillet. We, we lost mightily, but it was a key town. And when we attacked it, the Germans were in prepared positions. They already had their trenches dug. And we were attacking overland. Uh, and uh, that's a hell of a lot more difficult and more bloody when you're attacking a prepared position than it is when both sides are attacking on the ground. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, right here. I believe this gentleman would like to finish his story that he was up there. Well, let, let's give somebody else a chance. Come on up here, please. Up here. Come on up. Come on up. I understand when the 87th jumped off in the Battle of Alge, along with the 11th Armored Division, you ran in head-on into a, a German armored counterattack. 
Uh, can you tell a little bit about that in a certain sense? I know I have a friend with 11th Armor, and he said that was very, you know, difficult. Yeah. It's a meeting engagement. Anybody ever heard of a, this is an army term, I just came across it uh, a few years ago. A meeting engagement is when both sides attack simultaneously. That was a meeting engagement. The 11th Armored and the 87th took part. That was because of Patton's orders. You know, his uh, theory was uh, the only way you can win a war is attack, 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 and that's what he did. And uh, uh, the 11th Armored didn't perform too well if you read General Middleton, who was the Corps commander. I read his biography. He had to relieve the commanding general of the 11th Armored because he thought that the, the 11th Armored wasn't uh, uh, efficient enough. He uh, details a couple of engagements outside of Bastogne where he ordered both the 11th Armored and the 87th to attack. Uh, the commanding general of the 11th Armored came up to him, he says, and asked him if he would approve the withdrawal of one regiment of the 11th Armored uh, back and to have the 87th take its place. Uh, I'm not making this up, but it's, uh, it's in Middleton's uh, biography. And Middleton approved, but later on he replaced the general, sent him packing to England and got himself another commanding general. Middleton was a hell of a tactician, and it was he that uh, Patton wrote, your decision to hold Bastogne was a stroke of genius. You ever read that? I may have it here. Uh, that was uh, one of the classic letters of uh, World War II. He wrote him, your decision to hold Bastogne. But uh, Middleton was really uh, a very modest man, although in World War I he was very heroic, won all kinds of distinguished service crosses, silver stars, and so on. He was good in combat, and he said uh, in his biography that he was not really a genius. <laughs> he said that was just basic soldiering, that any commander would have made that decision. And uh, with that, I think we're going to uh, close this wonderful evening. And I'm very, very happy again to see all of you, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming. Second. It's really a testimonial to the people who fought the war and didn't come back, and I, I thank you for that. <clears throat> Mr. Cady, uh, here at the Army Heritage and Education Center, we flatter ourselves by saying that we tell the Army story one soldier at a time. We have no greater thrill than to welcome soldiers such as yourself who made the history that we all served in. As a small token of our appreciation, Please accept on behalf of the entire AHEC staff our, uh, your uh, reduced copy of your, uh, your poster that we used to advertise your lecture. Oh, isn't that nice? And you wait one more time. I would also like to ask all of our World War II veterans to please stand, especially the 87th. Please sir, come on up. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Meet these guys. What, what was your unit? 28th Division. Oh, 28th? You're the ones that let you get to the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it? Navy. Navy. Okay. 99. 99. Anybody from the 87th? Gentlemen, on behalf of all of us who are a bit younger than you, thank you for your service.